it's a pleasure to be here at this nice uh, and wonderful meeting. So having a very nice introduction from Tim and Heather in the morning on what we can do or should do in terms of immunogenicity assessment, I would like to present you now a case study what we actually did to analyze factor eight specific T cell epitopes. And we did not use a um, prediction tool, but we actually started off using a humanized um, mouse model for that purpose. So I would like to give you first a bit of an introduction on hemophilia because I don't know whether all of you are familiar with the disease hemophilia. And I would like to give a bit of an introduction on why we used exactly this mouse model. And then I will start off analyzing the T cell epitopes. So hemophilia A is an X-linked recessive bleeding disorder that affects about one in 5,000 to 10,000 men. It is uh, caused by mutations in the gene coding for clotting factor eight, thereby interfering with the clotting cascade. And uh, these gene mutations lead to either the diminished function of factor VIII or to the lack of endogenous production of factor VIII, meaning that there's no factor VIII present in these people. Um, the clinic symptoms are actually spontaneous bleedings, as you can see here on that picture, um, or, and hemorrhages. And those uh, symptoms start from very early age on when the um, boys start to um, move. Uh, the, Regular treatment for hemophilia is actually an intravenous replacement therapy with either recombinant or plasma-derived factor VIII products. And you give there, upon giving those, um, uh, this replacement therapy intravenously into patients uh, with actually severe hemophilia A, which is about 50% of the patient population, 30% uh, of these severe patients develop neutralizing anti-factor VIII antibodies, which are historically called factor VIII inhibitors. And um, it is not clear to us how the immune system decides whether or not to produce these antibodies as the rest of the patient stays inhibitor free during all treatment. So actually to answer that question, this is, a really, this, is a really, this is really the major question in the field of hemophilia. Uh, I would like to give you a bit of an introduction on immunology and I have a kind of in-between version of immunology picture here. Um, I tried to simplify it also a bit so um, to get a T cell uh, antibody response in hemophilia, it is known that this process is T cell dependent. So a uh, close interaction of an activated T cell and the B cell is needed to enable proliferation and differentiation of the B cell into an antibody producing plasma cell, which in turn produces these anti-factor VIII antibodies or so-called factor VIII inhibitors. But to get this activated T cell, so it step before this interaction, you would actually need another interaction of two cells. And this is the interaction of an antigen presenting cell and a CD4 T cell, as we have seen already in a couple of presentations before. And to get activated, this T cell needs to recognize a, um, a peptide that is presented on the surface of an antigen presenting cell together with some co-stimulatory interaction as indicated here to get activated and then to drive further on this immune response. So I will focus today on this interaction as this is the initial and we think also crucial interaction of different cell types in the cause of an immune response against factor VIII. Um, this cartoon should um, bring you, you know, to the fact that B cells and T cells recognize protein antigens in very different ways. B cells would recognize a protein antigen um, via a specific B cell receptor on the surface, with a, which is actually an antibody, which recognizes um, three-dimensional structures or also called conformational epitopes on a native protein. And this is in, in, very, um, in, in contrast to the T cells that recognize with, each, with, with their T cell receptor only processed peptides. So to get such a peptide, uh, the protein has to be taken up by an antigen presenting cell, has to be processed into small peptide fragments by proteolysis, and then has to be presented by an MHC class two molecule on the surface of the antigen presenting cell to be available for the T cell receptor. This cartoon shows you now a closer look at the MHC class two molecule. This, is an, um, this should be the MHC class two molecule here with its open binding groove. This means that actually peptides of variable lengths can fit in. So th these peptides are not restrict restricted in length as for MHC class one, but the peptide ends can hang out of the, of the binding groove. And this above here should be the peptide with its nine amino acid um, binding core depicted here in uh, red and uh, green. 
And uh, these uh, so-called MHC class two anchor residues can fit into designated binding pockets of the MHC class two and enable the contact between the peptide and the MHC class two. And the green uh, residues, colored here green, um, point outwards the binding groove and enable the contact to the T cell receptor. So the aim of this study was to specify dominant CD4 T cell epitopes um, of human factor VIII which are involved in the induction of anti-factor VIII antibodies in um, patients. Um, and to, you know, to start off with that question, we uh, took an approach where we wanted to apply a new human hemicyclus 2 transgenic mouse model for the identification of these factor VIII specific CD4 T cell epitopes involved in the induction of antibodies against factor VIII. So we did not start off with a prediction program as I already indicated in the beginning. We did that then much later on, and we um, were actually happy then to start not with that prediction because we got a lot of hits and we would have to test a lot of peptides afterwards. Um, but we took the advantage of an MHC class 2 transgenic mouse model to answer that question. In hemophilia, a lot of mouse models are in use. There's actually two conventional ones that are um, used rather frequently. This is um, to show you how they look like. This is the factor VIII gene, actually only a part of the exons present in the factor VIII gene, exon 15 to 19. Um, and we always compare our data to the factor VIII um, E17 model, which has a disruption of exon 17, leading to the lack of factor VIII protein and actually to a bleeding phenotype of this mouse model. So this mouse model has the same phenotype as in the patients. You have uh, increased bleeding and no factor VIII um, present. The other mouse model would be exactly like this one, but the disruption of the exon 17 has a really similar phenotype. So I will call that mouse model from now on conventional mouse model, and this mouse model uh, is always compared to our data then to our new human MHC class 2 transgenic mouse model. This mouse model or these mouse models are very nice models and very nice to look at hemophilia, but actually if you think about T cell epitopes, it is always important what MHC class 2 molecule is involved in the presentation of your immunogenic peptides. And um, in this mouse model, immunogenic peptides are presented by murine MHC class 2 molecules. And knowing that murine MHC class 2 molecules and human MHC class 2 molecules are rather different, this is a major limitation if you look for T cell epitopes that are relevant in the human situation. So what we did is we exchanged the murine MHC class 2 molecule by a human MHC class 2 molecule to look at actually proper T cell epitopes in these mice. Um, the MHC class 2 molecule that we choose uh, was actually HLA DRB1501. I will call it now HLA DR15 because otherwise I will misspell it too many times. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this was chosen as it is associated or was shown to be associated with a slightly increased risk for patients to develop neutralizing antibodies um, in, during factor VIII therapy having this specific HLA DR haplotype. And furthermore, this was also, it's also a very common HLA molecule, and it's one of the, it's one of the most frequent HLA-DR proteins worldwide. So the new mouse model that we developed looks exactly like this. It is still a hemophilic mouse, so it has a knockout of the murine factor VIII gene. It's an E17 mouse, um, and it carries the human HLA-DRB1-1501 um, on the background of a complete knockout of all murine MHC class 2 genes. So, to summarize that and to make that clear, in this mouse model, an antibody response against the protein antigen is initiated by CD4 T cells that do recognize peptides presented by DR15 because there is no other MHC class 2 present. So all antibody responses are driven via HLA DR15. Um, <clears throat> and now to start off, of course, we wanted to look at antibody responses first. In hemophilia, it's always looked at antibody responses. So you have uh, a comparison of our new humanized hemophilic mouse model and the conventional hemophilic mouse model having the murin MHC class 2 on the right side here. We treated both mice with factor VIII at 1,000 nanogram per dose um, in weekly intervals for up to eight weeks, and we draw blood one week after the last, um, in, after the last infusion. And uh, this schedule is actually resembles the, the treatment in patients where you also on, not only treat once, but treat multiple times and then afterwards get an antibody response. 
So if we look now at intravenous treatment, which I've told you before is the treatment um, that is normally used in patients. So the replacement therapy for factor VIII is factor VIII given intravenously. You can see that the conventional mice nicely develop anti-factor VIII antibodies. Um, when we compare the treatment to subcutaneous treatment, um, which might also be relevant for hemophilia because doctors often tell us that, you know, giving the factor VIII to small kids it's not always that easy. You have to hit the vein directly, and some of the factor VIII might get aside the vein and being then applied subcutaneously. Um, we wanted to make sure that we don't overlook something and also looked at subcutaneous application. And in the conventional mouse model, you cannot see a really difference between those two application routes. If we compare it now to the new transgenic mouse model, you can see that we see a clear difference in intravenous application. So we get a very um, more spread picture uh, of the antibody response after intravenous application of factor VIII, which very much resembles the situation found in the patients, where also not all, anti uh, not all patients develop anti-factor VIII antibodies, but only a fraction of them does. So this is really interesting to, to you know, figure out why some of those mice do develop antibodies and some of those do not. If we compare that now to subcutaneous uh, application, you can see that Tim <laughs> proposed a, a good thing in his talk. Uh, subcutaneous administration is much more anemogenic in these in this mice. So one obvious question, of course, I mean, this was a good control for us to make sure that those mice are able to use anti-factor antibodies because otherwise we could have, you know, we would have argued that maybe they're not all able to do so, but they are actually all able to do so. And so now the most obvious question was, what are the T-cell epitopes that drive these antibody responses against factor VIII in those HLADR15 transgenic animals? And whether there is a difference in the T-cell epitopes that drive the immune response to factor VIII after intravenous or after subcutaneous treatment. Um, the way we wanted to analyze those T-cell epitopes um, was actually the generation of CD4 T-cell hybridoma libraries. This is actually, this is a, rather long process, but it enables you to work with your T-cells really for, for a long time, stable. They will not get rid of their T-cell receptor. You would always have the T-cell receptor of your original clone, and it's a really nice system to always come back and look at it again. I will just give you a quick introduction how that works. Um, we again treated our mice with factor VIII, either intravenously or subcutaneously. We took this, the treatment schedule was like you've seen it before. Um, we treated, uh, we took the spleen cells, we in vitro re-stimulated the spleen cells with factor VIII uh, for three days actually. And then we took the blasting cells and uh, added BV thymoma cell cells. And these are thymoma cells that do not express a T cell receptor on their surface. Meaning that upon fusion of those two cells, you add up with a T cell hybridoma clone that is immortalized. So this is the nice part of a T cell clone and it will carry the T-cell receptor of your initial T-cell partner. And to test those uh, derived T-cell hybridoma clones for factor VIII specificity, we co-incubated them with antigen presenting cells and factor VIII, and those T-cell hybridoma clones will release IL-2 in the culture supernatant only if the antigen presenting cell um, cuts and presents a factor, a, the factor VIII peptide that is specific for this T-cell hybridoma clone. So um, we got a, a lot of factor VIII specific T cell hybridoma clones and then went on to further test them on factor VIII peptide libraries to specify exactly which epitope they are recognizing. So, so not to say only that they are factor VIII specific, but to especially um, uh, determine the epitope specificity of each clone. Uh, the way we looked into that was actually um, we uh, created factor VIII peptide pools. This is a schematic representation of the factor VIII. You can see that it's a rather large protein. It has 2,332 amino acids. And so if you cut that down in 15 mer peptides, what we did was a three amino acid offset, you end up with 780 different peptides consisting of 15 amino acids each. And that was done during my PhD th thesis, and I wanted to be, you know, finished at one point, so I didn't want to test all 780 different peptides single. <laughs> so I had to come up with a pooling strategy to enable testing of all the different T-cell clones that I established first with all the different peptides. Um, and I made sure in the end that each T-cell hybridoma clone was tested with the whole peptide library. 
And the way I did that is actually I stole the idea of somebody else. Um, they, I synthesized my peptide libraries using the spot synthesis method, um, where peptides are synthesized on a nitrocellulose membrane, and you actually do two identical membranes. So each dot here repre represents one peptide, and then you cut one membrane into horizontal stripes and one membrane into vertical stripes, and then you elute the peptides from your stripes, and these are your pools. And now I will um, introduce you how you know then which peptide is uh, actually the, the one that is recognized. So you test all your T cell hybridoma clones or your, your cells with uh, the peptide pools here marked in blue. The ones from one to eight uh, are the vertical ones and the ones from nine to 16, the horizontal ones. And uh, each pool consists of the following, uh, of, the, of, of their specific uh, single peptides shown here in black. And if we assume now that, for example, pool number three and pool number 12 was positive, I would know that peptide number 27 was recognized by my T-cell hybridoma clone. So this made me able to test that because I think I ended up with 65 pools then. This was somehow doable for all the different T-cell hybridoma clones. And these are already the data that we got out of that. So again, uh, just to remind you, we immunized with factor eight full length protein for eight uh, consecutive weeks. And we uh, actually took the spleen cells after the eight immunization and we did uh, the T cell hybridomas as I just explained to you before. And if we look now at intravenously treated animals, you can see that we find a pattern of factor eight specific T cell epitopes. This graph actually shows you the specificity on the X axis and the number of positive hybridomas for a given specificity on the Y axis. Uh, I marked those um, peptides here, not because of confidentiality, but just because to make it easier for you to follow now. Um, this is actually all published, so you can get all the sequences in that paper if you're interested. <clears throat> for intravenous application, we tested 62 T cell hybridomas so far, and you can see that we found a nice but small pattern of factor eight specific T cell epitopes after that uh, application. And uh, three of those T cell epitopes actually appeared more often than the others, which we call then afterwards dominant CD4 T cell epitopes. If we compare it now to the subcutaneous administration route, uh, you can immediately see that the pattern did not got way bigger. Um, and actually the three dominant epitopes from the intravenous application were also the three dominant ones after the subcutaneous application. If you look now a bit closer, you can see that there are minor differences between subcutaneous and intravenous, but to be honest, we are not really confident whether these are differences or whether these differences would go away if you would just enlarge the number of T-cell hybridomas that we would test for each, um, for, for each application route, as there is still a difference between the different uh, numbers of T-cell hybridomas that we generated. So, um, Knowing that actually, I would like to show you because I masked you all the numbers just to make sure that uh, where those T cell epitopes are. And I painted again the cartoon of factor eight with all these different domains. Um, and here depicted as light blue bars are the identified factor eight specific T cell epitopes. And as you can see, they are nicely spread over the whole factor eight molecule. Of course now, the question was, and I promised to you that I will compare my data, data to the conventional mouse model. So the question is, what the, how does a conventional mouse model would look like? And whether would we, would, we be, would, would we have been able to identify the same epitopes also using a conventional, not human MHG class two transgenic mouse model? And um, of course I did that. So now the black bars are the T cell epitopes from the conventional mouse model. And as you can see that they, over, they, they don't overlap at all. It's a completely different set of factor eight peptides using the conventional mouse model having a neuron hemicyclus two and the hemophilic mouse model, um, the new humanized hemophilic mouse model having a neuron, uh, human hemicyclus two, actually DR15. So <clears throat> of course the next question was whether those T cell epitopes are really valid. So we wanted to know whether these T cell epitopes are really present after immunization with factor VIII in, in, in HLA-DR15 mice to make sure that they are not an artifact of the T cell hybridoma technology where you manipulate your cells through a long process of time. So what we did, we immunized mice again with factor VIII subcutaneously, in this time only subcutaneously in weekly intervals. We took the spleen cells 
and then we in vitro re-stimulated the spleen cells either with full length factor VIII or with peptides for 16 hours and then afterwards did multicolor um, flow cytometry analysis of activated CD4 T cells. So in this uh, fax analysis we actually stained for live dead cells of course, we included an anti-CD4 T cell marker and of course, and we included an anti-CD40 ligand antibody. This is also called CD154. And this is actually a marker for recently activated antigen-specific T cells. So the gating strategy that we used is pretty straightforward. We gated on lymphocytes. We excluded doublets in all various ways. We gated on live cells. We gated on CD4 T cells, so on the total CD4 T cell population. And then we look now at a picture on where CD4 is on the x-axis and CD40 ligand on the y-axis, and we're interested in the double positive population. So this double positive population are the recently activated factor VIII or peptide-specific T cells found in our mice. So if we um, use only medium, so the, this is our medium negative control, you can see that we find almost no Double positive T cells is a population of 0.02%, which is actually the background level. If you use now factor VIII, you can see that we find a very nice population of 0.17%. I can tell you this is already a huge number. So T cell people are really happy with this <laughs> huge percentage. <laughs> um, and of course, now we wanted to know whether um, if we would stimulate only with the peptides that we have identified, whether we would get the same kind of stimulation. So using now only the three immune dominant peptides, um, so I marked them again, U, W, and X, to make sure that you remember, um, we get also, again, a very nice stimulation of factor VIII specific T cells. Um, if, we, if we use the same peptide sequences, but in a scrambled version as a negative control, we can again reduce the, back, the signal back to the background signal, which was kind of our second negative control. And of course, we were also interested what is the uh, contribution of each of the single peptides uh, to, the, to the total staining. And when we did that, you can also see that if we stimulate our cells with the single immunodominant T cell epitopes um, or peptides, we also can get a nice stimulation uh, of, or population of factor VIII specific or peptide specific T cells here. So we were quite confident that we really um, identified the most immunodominant T-cell epitopes in these mice. And um, to further go on, the next question was, of course, whether human dendritic cells would be able to do the same. I mean, still, it's a mouse model, and still, it's HLA-DR transgenic, correct, but still, it's a mouse. So the question was whether a human, a human dendritic cell, it's actually human monocyte-derived dendritic cells from an HLA-DR15 homozygous donor, would be able to process and present the same set of factor VIII peptides um, as our mice did. So what we did is we co-cultured um, human monocyte derived dendritic cells together with factor VIII full length protein and uh, the corresponding T cell hybridoma clones and checked whether we can find any activation of those clones. So meaning that the T cell hybridomas release only L2 if the right peptide was going to be processed and presented by the human HLA-DR uh, um, positive dendritic cells. So only if the right peptide was being made, the T cell hybridomas would release IL-2. And these are the data. So this is again hybridomas in here in black from, uh, from the HLA-DR15 mice. And each of the um, uh, letters is again corresponding to one hybridoma specificity. And uh, on the y-axis, you can see the IL-2 release actually in fold induction. And uh, I compared the, those data from hybridomas derived from the conventional mouse and just as a negative control. And as you can see, the dendritic cells were able to present all of those different peptides to our T-cell hybridoma clones. Meaning that the human hla dr 15 the human hla 15 expressing antigen presenting cells are actually able to generate and present the same set of peptides as identified in our hla dr 15 transgenic hemophilic mice. So uh, the next question was, of course, you could tell me now, this is DR15, what about all the rest? Of course, you're right. <laughs> what about all the rest? So I did not want to make a new mouse model during my PhD. So I decided to, uh, to assess the promiscuity of the, of the identified T-cell epitopes 
using an in vitro binding assay that is actually uh, done by Proimmune. So we used a technology from Proimmune called Reveal to actually answer the question whether those peptides that we identified are able to bind to multiple MSG class 2 haplotypes others than HLA-DR15. So rephrasing the question, are they also important for patients not HLA-DR15 positive? And um, what, how does this assay look like? Actually, I think people in the audience can probably better explain how it looks like, but I will give it a try. So this is the so-called reveal assay where uh, this assay determines the ability of each of the peptides to bind to an MSG class 2 protein of choice and uh, is always compared to a positive and an intermediate control peptide. And it measures actually the, the ability of each of the peptides to stabilize the MSG class 2 peptide complex, which is achieved by a conformational antibody. And uh, the detection is based on the presence or absence of the native conformation of this MSG class 2 peptide complex. So we um, use the wide range of uh, HLA-DR um, uh, molecules. Uh, you can see that we use six different ones. They are actually covering a large part of the human population. And um, these data are presented as a cumulative panelil um, binding score, meaning that you get the binding uh, of each uh, of the different, so the height is made up of the Contrib individual contribution of each of the LALs to the total binding score, and this is all relative to the positive control. And uh, what you can see immediately is that all of those epitopes were able to bind to multiple MHC class 2 proteins, which made us confident that the epitopes that we identified are also important for patients other than HLA-DR15 positive. Um, of course, we were also interested whether they have similar or different binding kinetics to the different HLA-DR molecules, and their proimmune also offers a nice assay. This is the so-called full-rate assay, and we also did that with those uh, T-cell epitopes. And there you, there you actually determine um, the kinetic score, which is uh, given by the off-rate divided through the on-rate of each peptide per each allele. And um, what you can see here immediately is that um, the different peptides um, have different um, uh, kinetic scores for the different HLA-DR molecules, which is not surprising, but this maybe would maybe tell us that, the different, that there are different subsets of T cells involved in the different, uh, for the different epitopes. So I think this needs to, have to, to this ask for further investigation, whether, those, whether this peptide, for example, uh, involves different T cell subsets compared to, for example, those immunodominant T cell epitopes. And uh, to summarize what, I, what I've told you today is uh, that we are confident that the mouse model was a good choice to analyze factor VIII specific T cell epitopes. In this mouse model, the antibody response against factor VIII um, actually depends very much on the application route, like Tim indicated already in the morning. The incidence of the antibodies is higher after subcutaneous treatment compared to after intravenous application. And we were able to find a limited set of factor VIII peptides, also called CD4 T cell epitopes, that drive the antibody response against factor VIII in these humanized mice. And um, the immunodominant epitopes are the same after intravenous and after subcutaneous application of factor VIII. And last but not least, factor VIII specific T cell epitopes that we have identified in these mice are able to bind to a number of different HLA-DR proteins when tested with Proimmune's uh, Reveal Class II technology assay. And um, I think what I've just also told you on the last slide, we would need to have future studies whether the different binding kinetics that we have identified using the full rate assay uh, actually result in functional differences of the different T cell clones involved in these uh, immune responses. So I would like to acknowledge the people that did the work and that helped me with the work. It is actually the people that worked with me in the lab. Of course, my supervisor, Birgit Reipert, uh, our collaboration partners who actually, David, which learned me how to do T-cell hybridomas, uh, which ta who taught me how to do T-cell hybridomas, and uh, Lars Fugger, who uh, uh, gave us a part of the mouse. And I would like to thank also the Center of in uh, Innovation and Technology of the City of Vienna, who also supported us with an additional grant. And I would like to thank you for your attention.